I think we are going to start. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming to our uh, Innovative Discovery Series lecture. This is very impressive, very impressive crowd. So thank you very much. We are delighted, really delighted, to have one of ours, David Chen, who is an hospitalist at Christian Care and a Value Institute Fellow, to give us a talk about firearm violence in Wilmington. But before I introduce him, let me mention some housekeeping issues. So as you know, for CME credit, you must sign in and must include your email and credentials. There is a sign-in sheet here on the table. Uh, our next tech talk is on September 6th. And also, we don't have an ID series next week, but our next one is August 17th, and we'll have a special guest from the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Haley Germack, who will be speaking on increasing follow-up attendance after acute inpatient psych psychiatric stays. So please register, uh, register to help us prepare. This is going to be also very interesting. And as always, our full schedule is posted on our website, dectr.org. So Dr. Chen is an attending physician in internal medicine and pediatry at Christiana Care, and is also responsible for emergency department and trauma consultations and resident education. He has a Bachelor of Sciences from Princeton in electrical engineering, and an MD and MPH, an MPH from Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. He did a combined internal medicine pediatrics residency at Christiana Care and AI DuPont Hospital for Children and is currently co-investigator for a project funded by the Harrington Fund uh, Value Institute Co Community Partnership uh, Grant, which is related to health conditions of victims of penetrating trauma. He is a very popular speaker and has given multiple lectures on health disparities and social determinants of health. Yes, I, I, I saw it in your CV. <laughs> has been and is very uh, and is still very active in multiple community organizations which goals are to address social determinants of health and decrease violence so for example he's a member of the wilmington community advisory committee which was created to examine youth firearm violence in wilmington and provide recommendations he's also uh, instructor for the community-based stop the bleed training in bleeding control member of also member of street medicine first aid and many many others very very impressive so thank you very much david and we look forward to your presentation thank you. it's really my honor to be here um because i'm here to represent i think a groundswell of people in the community that have been invested in this in a very long time um, i would really want to give special thanks to the trauma department and the surgeons who have really been doing this work for a number of years um, and really to the community of Wilmington who this has been um, an ongoing deeply deeply painful issue um, for for many people their lifetime and uh, their families as well <clears throat> and so well it's already I have a, a few disclosures uh, as mentioned co-recipient of the Harrington value grant for which I'm very grateful um, and a junior board member for the Delaware Coalition Against Gun Violence, as well as an advisor to the Wilmington Community Advisory Council, of whom we have a few representatives here today. Uh, so the, the expert in the room is not myself. Um, the expert in the room are really the people in the community that have lived through this, um, whose daily experience involves dealing with a lot of the trauma. Um, but I think it is, it, it is worth taking a moment here to talk about how we interface as the medical system with patients who are survivors of violent trauma. And I say this because there is this stigma that's associated, that often goes unspoken, even in the research literature, that really needs to be addressed because it's foundational to the issues that we're trying to address. Um, and so I have a quote here from a book written by Dr. John Rich, who's up with Healing Her People in Philadelphia, and he's really pioneered um, the field in many ways. <clears throat> and this is a quote from a series of narratives that he described about patients that he had met, cared for in the hospital setting. But a stark reality remained. My colleagues and, to be honest, most everyone I knew, we all carried around inside us an unspoken assumption. When a young black man rolled into the emergency room with a gunshot wound, we all assumed that it wasn't just bad luck. He didn't just get shot, he got himself shot. This assumption was confirmed in the murmurs that followed the patient's departure from the trauma suite. The ER team cleaned themselves up and washed their hands with a kind of disgusted satisfaction. Sure, they did their job and saved a life, but they were pretty sure, lacking evidence or information to the contrary, that they had saved the life of a drug dealer, 
gangbanger, or some other stereotype of a young black male absorbed from the news or television. They were desperate to stop this flow of injury and death, but there was a hovering nihilism that these people were who they were and nothing could be done about it. The nurse caring for Carrie Brooks, a patient in the ICU, was painting with the same broad brush based on her own experience of seeing the most violently injured patient. But her impressions had to have been shaped by the reports that came up from the emergency room and by the opinions of providers who had little direct contact with young men like Carrie. I was sure that her opinions had not been shaped by Carrie because in his paralysis, he was unable to utter a word. And we're going to be talking about quite a few things. Um, wasn't certain how uh, varied the audience would be today. So there will be something new, I think, for everybody here in the room. I'm um, going to be focusing a lot on studies and the evidence behind what is the epidemiology behind firearm violence. We'll contextualize that to Wilmington and talk about path, uh, a path forward. Um, but I did want to start with that to really frame the conversation in being able to say, what are the biases that we, that I bring to the table whenever I see a patient of firearm violence and how does that line up with reality? How much of that is influenced by culture, um, by my own culture that I grew up in, by the culture that other people have set before me, and how do we change that to something more realistic? <coughs> so we'll begin with the national story. This is from a Health Affairs uh, article in October of 2017, so you know it's legit. Um, and this is just across the nation from 2006 to 2014, what are the firearm-related injuries by type of injury um, and intent? And so you see here, um, handgun, shotguns, hunting rifle, military rifle, unspecified other. What I want you to pay attention to here are the unintentional and the assault categories in comparison to the suicide. So thankfully, legal represents a fairly small fraction. It's virtually undetectable here. Um, but here, handguns are associated with a pretty high volume of assault and unintentional. Um, you see unintentional here, accidental. Um, hunting rifles make up a large part of that. Military rifles make up a surprising amount of the assault category. Um, shotguns for both of these here. And keep this in the back of your mind as we advance through these next set of slides. Here, these are percentages from, again, the same review um, by age and by category of uh, type of injury. And so what is the outlier here? And which of these groups is not like the other? So clearly, the 18 to 29 age group is by far and away across all categories the majority of these incidents um, and victims. But which of these demographics is not really like the other in terms of age? Suicide, right? So all the others follow a little bit more of a, hesitate to call it normal distribution, but some form of distribution. And suicide, actually, the prevalence as you go higher in age is something that remains fairly steady. This is a really, I think, stunning slide because we see here, um, the age breakdown by about five-year aliquots, um, but also the disposition by sex. And here, by far and away, males are involved with it predominantly. Remember, this also includes you know, unintentional, suicide-related assault. Um, even with the suicide, this is looking at firearm-related injuries. This does not include fatalities that occurred in the field or in the pre-hospital setting. Um, and so when you look at the suicide data, you have to keep that in mind as a lot of them unfortunately successfully completed it. That skews it a little bit. But even so, vast majorities are males. And again, in this age range here, 15 really up to about 30 years of age, the lion's share. What was really interesting is they actually drilled down in this study, again, looking at uh, across the nation. Um, sorry, this should be 2006 up here to 2014. And they looked at the injury severity score, uh, the category thereof, and the injuries type. And I think what really uh, jumped out at me was how the sheer volume actually has a fairly low injury severity. Um, and I feel this speaks to all of the injuries that come into the emergency department are treated and then go home from the emergency department because they were a graze or something that does not necessarily flag a lot more attention because it doesn't have that criticalness to it, that urgency to it, um, and yet makes up really the vast majority, um, I would say, if you look at across handgun, shotgun, hunting rifle, military rifle, all of the types of injury come to think. And so the question in my mind is, how much are we paying attention to this category here um, when a lot of resources are inevitably devoted to the ones that are a higher severity score? Another thing to pay attention to here 
is the assault category um, and how this also with a handgun again takes the lion's share of firearm injuries in the United States. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's a little jittery yeah, here, so yeah, Thanks. down. We look at this as broken down by insurance type and the things that are notable here, we, we kind of already knew the age demographic from the earlier slides, um, but taking a look at the distinction between private insurance um, versus Medicaid or self-pay, um, you see, I'm trying to get this cursor to work. Um, the distinction here in suicide, in terms of the percentages represented with private insurance as compared to Medicaid or self-pay population um, related to the others, particularly for assault. And then you also look here in terms of the volume of injuries and the income quartile that they represent. So here again, 47.5% of the unintentional injuries are in the lowest income quartile. 54.4% of the assault injuries are in the lower, lowest income quartile and essentially almost 80% of that is within the lower half of the income uh, quartile. This was fascinating. They actually extrapolated this out to what is the burden of cost of care for these patients. And what's interesting is the severity um, did have a significant amount of cost associated with it, but it was these injuries that were low on the severity scale just by sheer volume that actually contributed the bulk of the cost to medical care. Again, our vulnerable populations being young men and particularly within the Medicaid or self-pay population. And so this brings up some interesting questions about what are the economic correlates of gun violence? Um, I use the word correlate here specifically rather than saying economic consequences. Um, there is a lot of policy debate that's ongoing and political conversation as to which comes first, which is the chicken, which is the egg. We know that there is a correlate to poverty. Um, the question is, is what begat what? You know, was it violence that caused conditions that were more deprived in the neighborhood and that stole away resources, that pushed people who had the means to go out of that neighborhood to go out of the neighborhood? Um, or did the violence already begin in those neighborhoods that were of lesser means? Um, and so this was an interesting study slash report done by the Urban Institute and where they looked at a number of different cities and across them um, looked kind of prospectively and, or retrospectively, but looking forward in time um, as to when a gunshot incident occurred or when a homicide occurred in a given neighborhood, what happened to business in that area following that? If there was a surge in the number of gunshots, what happened to businesses, what happened to residences in that area? And some of these we find not so surprising. So in Minneapolis, Oakland, San Francisco, and DC, they found that a surge in gun homicides was then followed by reduction in retail growth by 4%, slowed home value appreciation by 3.9%, did not affect home ownership or credit scores rate directly. Unclear why that is. Um, one we can make the argument in that neighborhood, maybe a lot of people who own the homes did not live in the homes necessarily. Um, if there was a gunshot surge, I believe this was defined by 10 or more shots in a given period of time in Baton Rouge, Minneapolis, Oakland, San Francisco, San Francisco DC, they again thought that it slowed home value appreciation. But this didn't hold up in all of the cities studied. Um, so when they tried to break it down into what does a single incident do, right? So each additional gun homicide, they said in the Minneapolis census tract, they felt resulted in that next year of 80 fewer jobs. But that didn't hold across all of the cities. So the question was, were these neighborhoods that were not quite as stable, were these neighborhoods that were in transition where they had economic opportunity and right at that time a surge occurred or a homicide occurred and that kind of chilled it out. Whereas other cities, they had these levels of violence already established in these neighborhoods. And so an additional homicide did not necessarily drive away economic investment because it had already not really been there. Um, they asked this question in Washington, D.C. They found that every 10 additional gunshots in a census tract, they felt resulted in 20 fewer drops uh, in that area, 20 fewer things to, to go towards new establishments, one less new business opening, one more business closing in that same year. Um, but then you compare that to San Francisco and they, they didn't find that association. Again, the question was, what was going on in the neighborhood 
before. And it brings us to this, this point that I would like you to keep in your mind is that every city is different and every city struggles with its own local culture in different ways. Um, similarly, every city has resiliency things built into that culture that can be taken advantage of in a positive way to really build a culture that can push back against these trends as well. So it becomes very difficult to make these comparisons from city to city and quite frankly, between large cities and small cities. So Wilmington is a small city. Um, can we actually extrapolate a lot of the data done in these larger cities and larger contexts? Is a really interesting and difficult question. Um, one that comes up is what is the recidivism associated with violence? Um, and when I was reviewing the, the literature on this, it, it continued to, to really sh to shock me as to how bad these numbers can be. Um, so some of these studies are a bit older. Um, the best known one here is uh, Sims uh, back in 1989. Uh, they, sur they surveyed uh, 501 survivors of urban trauma. They looked at five-year follow-up in the area. They found that 44% essentially recidivism rate, meaning a repeat violent injury occurring in that population. 20% of them died within the next five years. I'm going to say that 20% of them died within the next five years. You think about these are young men who really have, for the most part, fairly minimal medical comorbidities, and they are dead within five years. And a lot of them came through our doors of our institute. Other studies are unfortunately not much more hopeful on that. Um, some of these are a little bit more recent. Um, again, numbers in the 40, 50 percent range. 58 percent in the Richardson study had two or more hospitalizations for violent injury and correlates to having higher rates of recidivism, um, substance abuse, having a previous fight in the past year, perceived disrespect as precursor violence, previous incarceration. Um, note that this is, a, this is a selected population. These are those that participate in a violence intervention program. So you can make the argument that this rate is a little bit higher because they're targeting those that are already identified at high risk. Um, but also at the same time, these are those that consented to being in a violence injury prevention program. So these are people who are also seeking help at the same time. And this study here, um, looking really more on the pediatric population, um, found a 59% recidivism um, really within a 24 month span, so really just two years. Um, and they actually, this was a nice study because they actually did it prospectively and they did a comparison to a control cohort, um, those who had drug use um, but were not violently injured um, and found that the recidivism was higher in the population that had been violently injured in the initial, um, initial setting. So this comes back to this question that may be an odd question to think about, um, but what is the pathophysiology of violence? We don't really think about violence as having pathophysiology, right? We don't think of it as something that has a biological consequence or effect, but the literature increasingly shows that it does. It absolutely does. We might hear other terms for this, toxic stress, allostatic load. Um, if you want to do the PubMed search, that's the flood I encourage you to kind of go down that pathway. Um, the mechanisms behind it are not yet clear. Um, a lot of it goes back to things like the ACE study, the adverse childhood events. I didn't really get into that here because it is its own kind of subset of information and in academic inquiry. But um, some of the reviews were going into it. And the idea being that if you grow up in an environment where you are chronically stressed, does that have an impact on you, on your development, on your neurobiology, on your hormonal biology, on your physiology, on the inflammatory markers? And the American Academy of Pediatrics has really fully embraced this as explaining quite a few different things in terms of healthcare disparities, in terms of developmental changes that they witness. A lot of this was in the news recently when we were talking about child separation and the terms, again, toxic stress came up a lot, coming back to a very similar body of research here that's been pursued for maybe 10, 20 years now. And so some of the studies that are out there suggest, and these are all of different potential biological mechanisms by which violence could have an impact. Um, so abnormal immune system functioning, elevation inflammation levels, um, things like CRP, fibrinogen, white cell count. Um, and they found persistence in these abnormal levels even years after traumatic events. And Dr. Mary Dozier down at the University of Delaware has done some fascinating research where after giving therapy for some of that trauma, showing a decline in these inflammatory levels just from those interventions alone. Um, some studies have shown in the pediatric population telomere erosion, um, 
beginning is in a detectable sample as early as age five and still being present up to age 10 um, when they were finishing the study. The thing is, they, there's some question about the methodology for that, and so they were hesitant to extrapolate that throughout the whole lifespan, but still that there was evidence of that in that young age is notable. Um, we know from quite a body of research um, that childhood exposure to violence associated with poor mental health in general, um, especially in adolescence and then later on in adulthood. The thing that's difficult here is that not all children who are exposed to a traumatic event go on to develop those sequelae. Um, actually, the, most, the majority of them do not. Um, but there is a subset that does seem to be more vulnerable, that does seem to be more predisposed, and does much more poorly prospectively going forward. So other questions associated with this, is that related to chronic ongoing victimization? Um, we do know that there is kind of a dose-dependent response to this, that the more that someone is exposed to these things, the more likely they are to develop these problems later on, um, both from a behavioral perspective, from an inflammatory perspective, all these sort of things. And some of the more um, really interesting things uh, was looking at actual differences in neuroimaging. And so they found that people who have been exposed to chronic stress in childhood do show differences in the way that their hippocampus form, their amygdala forms, the prefrontal cortex. Um, and for the neurobiologists in the room, as you may be familiar with, these are the things that control and regulate how we respond to the environment. They regulate the things that control how we respond to stress. Not surprising because these abnormalities may be induced by these high stress loads, but if you think about it, then does that then alter the way in which you are actually able to respond to an incident in a maladaptive way? And can that actually increase then your likelihood to become a victim to further stress down the road? Um, we do know that firearm, firearm violence is, has a high association with PTSD. And not only that, that the fact that it was a firearm matters in the development of the brain. Right? And so this study found that a patient who was affected by a firearm injury was 13 times more likely as compared to those that presented to the trauma department from a fall twice as likely from those that were in a motor vehicle. So there's something particular to the nature of firearm injury as an assault um, with people, which does not surprise us, I think, if you, if you think about it, but the research is that out. So this was alluding to earlier, the neurobiology of toxins. And this is the proposed mechanism. This image is straight out of the AAP recommendations and their guidance statements and policy and so on and so forth. Um, but again, this idea that there is this biologic dysregulation that occurs because the stressor induces this inflammatory response in the body, and the body, in trying to compensate for that, um, then does it in dysregulatory ways. Um, so either in excess with cortisol or in paucity, either leading to more immune suppression or lower inflammation. And people have gone on to kind of hypothesize that perhaps this explains things like why there are higher rates of asthma um, in the urban environment. <coughs> and a number of other lines. The emotional dysregulation, I think, is the, the piece that uh, makes most intuitive sense, that people have been exposed to violent trauma and repeatedly exposed to violent trauma um, begin to develop a defense mechanism towards that that may not always be positively adaptive in all settings. Right? And so it may be fitting to the setting that if you have this repeated exposure to that you shut down, Right? that you conserve essentially your emotional uh, predispositions, um, or that you act out strongly to counter that as a defense mechanism. But if you're waiting in line for, oh, say, food at a, at a talk, um, acting out in those ways may not always be beneficial. Um, and does this cause those problems with um, interacting with the medical system that leads to disparate care? Um, this is a very interesting question. Is violence a contagion? So Dr. Gary Slutkin, has this wonderful TED Med talk online. You can go Google it and see it. Um, but he makes the argument um, that violence should be seen and should be treated as an infectious disease, right? And what are the precursors for infectious transmission patterns? Um, they cluster in space. They're geographically co-located. Um, they spread in this epidemic, nonlinear fashion, but it spreads in a person-to-person, -person, right, a host-to-host -host kind of fashion, right? And his argument is that violence does all of those things. Someone who is violently injured, right? his argument is incubates that. They may not necessarily react to it, but they are at higher risk for doing it. There are certain factors, resiliency factors, or risk factors that make them more or less susceptible to then 
expressing that violence out where it may then affect somebody else and then essentially perpetrate the contagion of violence. That this happens, again, person to person, so it makes sense that it happens clustered in space. Um, and that when you increase the frequency of these things, you're more likely to see that cluster in space and occur in an epidemic. Uh, going through the actual literature and research on it, I think there is, you know, you can make that argument. Um, things that are more definitively demonstrated in the research based on this epidemiologic review. If you have a perpetrator of violence in one of your networks, um, you yourself are at direct risk of victimization from that perpetrator. Makes sense best seen in the intimate partner and the parental violence population, um, but also in the firearm violence population generally. There's a close association with perpetrator increased vulnerability to victimization in other contexts. Um, so if a sibling is affected, you are more likely, even though you were not directly abused um, or violently assaulted, um, to become a victim, um, but also more likely to then also become a perpetrator as well. If you are exposed to violent perpetration by a social network member, meaning a friend of yours, you are at a higher propensity for violent perpetration yourself. Um, this holds true even independent of gang affiliation. Violent victimization of a close member may predispose to violent action in retaliation or perceived self-defense. Um, this again holds true within the gang association, outside of the gang association, within families, right? Um, also related to the intimate partner, uh, environment as well. High risk behaviors also increase risk for both perpetration as well as victimization, um, both to the individual. These risk behaviors among peers also increase your risk. Um, so it, it all tends to go together. And I'm going to go through a, a very briefly a series of studies kind of elucidating this a little bit more. Uh, if you're exposed to physical fight at home during childhood, often between parents, you are 2.62 times more likely to have weapon perpetration in adult. If someone in your family or a close friend was shot, similar, more than doubling your risk of perpetrating violence as an adult. Some of that might be confounded by fear of victimization they acknowledge that in that study. These were really interesting studies. Um, and see this name pop up a number of times, Papa Christos, um, doing a lot of work on formal network analysis. And this study in Boston found what they did was they, they looked at these co-offending networks, so people who were essentially charged with a crime together, um, and built out a network model and set of associations. And they found that 85% um, of all gunshot victims were in one single network where you can make literally the person-to-person -person contact with people involved with these co-offending issues. And they represented less than 5% of the population at least. Similarly, immediate associates in this network were themselves uh, experiencing increased odds of being a victim of gun violence. Um, and then as you then increase the number of degrees of freedom, that risk then declined by 1% each time you did another step out, right? So in some sense, you know, the environment that you're in, the people that you are in contact with influences you very strongly. And what was notable about these studies is that these are looking at social networks, right? This is not necessarily neighborhood level analysis, though a lot of them do happen together in the neighborhood. Um, we'll get to the importance of that. Similar study in Chicago, they looked at a single neighborhood. They again found 41% of homicides were in a single network containing less than 4% of neighbors population. And they said uh, gang affiliation did have a strong influence. Then they did this study, um, looking at the entire city of Chicago right, over a number of years. And we'll talk about this study in a little more detail. Found 6% of the population represented 40% of all that were arrested, um, and that nearly 70% of all non-fatal injuries were in that network. Not only that, every 1% increase in somebody who was a victim increased your odds of victimization by 1.1%. And that may not sound like a lot, but when you get towards five, 10, 20 associates that have been shot, that number increases substantially. Um, as I said, gang membership did feature in all of them. This study in Newark um, was interesting in that they looked at diffusion across neighborhoods and across time. And what they found was that gangs actually came up after there was already a high density of firearm injuries in that neighborhood. And so this question as to whether the 
predisposition of violence within that neighborhood actually led to or contributed to the formation of gangs as a protective measure. So they just kind of put that out there as a hypothesis, um, but it was, it was, it was notable. Um, this was a, a study in 2014. What's interesting is that this was published in Justice Quarterly, not one to uh, typically publish a lot of information on contagious or infectious disease, but they took this infectious disease modeling approach. And what they did was they tracked the movement essentially of violence through uh, different neighborhoods in the city. Um, they found, again, like I said, that um, these tended to emerge from areas that were already a little bit higher in incidence of homicides. Um, what's notable is that this assumes what they call the aerial transmission. Um, so literally adjacent neighborhoods um, as this pattern for transmission, as opposed to social networks and social contacts. Um, this also took place over a number of years, um, so a bit of a slower diffusion. What was really interesting with this study, and we, we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, and this one, they, this is the one where they did across the entire city of Chicago, looking at all of these um, network associates. And what they did was they got all of this data from the Chicago Police Department. Um, it was uh, arrest data, and they looked at essentially people who were co offenders so people who were arrested together. And they said, okay, um, for an arrest event, we have these people who are then linked by that arrest event. Um, then they started mapping that out and then created essentially these edges to connect the different individuals and then reflect the density of those relationships. Um, and then this is a visual depiction of um, those that were involved with a fatal or non-fatal gunshot injury compared to those that were not. And they do cluster together. Moreover, they then built a probabilistic contagion model. So they said, if somebody in this network gets shot today, Within this same day, who then immediately experiences an elevation risk of being shot prospectively? Can we predict that based on people in that network um, and degrees of association? And does this outperform trying to make those same predictions just based on classic risk factors associated with those of high injuries, such as age um, and gender? And what they found is that both were useful. Both were able to do a little bit of prediction there. And when you use both of those things together, again, individual demographic data, as well as this social contagion model, you actually had the best ability to predict. Um, and so they felt that about 60% of fatal episodes were attributable to the social contagion. Um, and that for those in the 1% risk, they could identify 6.5% um, of those that would be vulnerable that day. 6.5% doesn't sound like a lot, um, but when you're talking about a fairly small network to begin with, when you're talking about the city of Chicago, uh, that actually then allows you to begin to perhaps consider focusing your efforts with intervention or prevention. And that's what we really want to get to. So that is kind of the national story, the national picture. I'm going to talk about Wilmington, be a little bit more specific and see if we can contextualize it. Um, first, I'm going to read you a quote. This was an interview I conducted with a, a friend of mine from uh, Pine Street. So I lived on the north side of the city um, for about two and a half years during my residency training. And what was remarkable to me is that what I dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis was the pipes freeze and did the landlord not want to address it and you know, like those kind of housing and other day-to-day -day things. But when I came to the hospital and I talked with my peers, the number one question they asked me over and over again was, what do you think? Oh, why haven't you been shot yet? Right? And it was kind of this joke, right? And I, I got it, but it really hurt because those were my neighbors living in those same neighborhoods. And I didn't feel people really feeling compelled to ask that same question of them, a bit pejorative. Um, so interviewing my friend here about the toll that this has taken in, in, our, in our city, these are his words. The guy who taught me how to read, he was shot and killed in his car. And I think that's the earliest remembrance of someone getting shot. And then a friend of mine who lived behind me, his brother was shot and killed in front of him. Just recently, one of my old students, he was shot and killed. It's just like, it's kind of like a piece of you is missing. Even if you didn't hang out with this person every day, you don't consider him a close friend, it's still somebody you're used to seeing as part of your neighbor. They're no longer there anymore, so it takes away whatever blessing God had that person being in that neighborhood. And it takes away a piece of someone else, because that was someone's child, someone's family member, brother. It's just somebody gone from your neighborhood. That is much harder to measure when we talk about research and statistics and the impact on the community. How do you, how do you even begin to study something? I, I remember hearing about this article in Parenting Magazine 
Top 10 most dangerous cities in America, number one, Wilmington, Delaware, based on the rate of violent crimes per 10,000. This made big news. Um, Newsweek, Murder Town, USA, headlining, aka Wilmington, Delaware, Delaware. In fact, it was such big news that Jada Pinkett Smith almost made a TV show out of it. Um, it was going to be this ABC drama. She was going to be the hot new DA coming into the city. Um, <laughs> and then there was a, a ruckus from Wilmington, appropriately so, saying, you're going to doom us. Right? Now no one's going to want to come to Wilmington. No one's going to want to invest in it. No one's going to want to move forward past that. That's become part of our identity. And we don't want it to be part of our identity. Right? We don't want people to know us for the place where people get shot. Right? The joke was, you know, the old name of the city was a place to be somebody, and then people would kind of, in dark humor, say a place to be a body right? in Wilmington. Right? Think about if you were to describe the neighborhood you were living in in that way. So they did... Um, Turned down the TV show, choice uh, selection of words, Murder Town TV show probably did at this point. Um, but if you look back here um, at other headlines within the News Journal, and this is just within the past few months, um, really. So Wilmington, most dangerous place in America for youth. If you adjust for youth, um, you're five times more likely um, to be shot than to drown in Delaware. That's the comment. Uh, this, uh, this was uh, an article just a few days ago. A Wilmington grandfather buries a yet another grandchild lost to gun violence. I think he had three other grandchildren. And the economy suffers. So the things that we know in the national literature and research certainly bring itself to bear in our local community. This is a picture from uh, across the street. I live actually on the house directly facing it. I knew them as, uh, as friends. Um, Talk about the woman in the middle. So I came, uh, I moved out of the neighborhood because of a series of incidents that happened to me. And I came back to visit um, for the gentleman on the left's birthday. He wasn't at home. So I was like, oh, well, who am I going to leave this birthday cake or whatever for? And the woman um, was out in front. And she was telling me, she was like, oh, I'm really worried about going back to the doctor um, tomorrow because I have a CAT scan that might tell me I might have cancer. And the teenage boys shot out my window. Right? And that really struck me. Right, that this woman who was worried about having cancer, which she did, but she died from not even a year later, was in the same sentence talking about fire and violence. Uh, we are privileged and honored to have some people who conducted this study here in the room. Um, this was a novel study in 2013 by the Participatory Action Research Group. And what they did was hire and train as researchers people from the community um, who were formally involved with the streets and our criminal system, uh, justice in the previous um, to go out and survey east side and south bridge communities which traditionally or historically in wilmington had fairly high rates of uh, gun violence and the the findings are stunning and they are real because it is this very granular and also ground level information as opposed to say me who tends to stick out a little bit going and knocking on door to door and getting survey results um, 55% of people surveyed lost at least one family member. And in fact, it, the, the picture of violence, of endemic and epidemic violence within the city is even worse, right? How many times have you seen someone else threatened with serious bodily harm? The majority, right? nearly 70%, right? More than 12 times, 26%, a quarter. How many times have you seen someone else beaten up or mugged? Again, majority of the time. How many times have you been slapped, punched, or hit by someone? A majority here, but again, you have this disturbing percentage here where it's more than 12 times. And how many times have you been beaten up or mugged? Uh, my, one of my next door neighbors, young man, my age, um, he told me how he had had an incident with guns seven times on the receiving end, right? He had never been shot, been mugged seven times, pistol whipped, just some kind of violent altercation involving a gun. Um, and knowing him, I knew he would not be someone to retaliate, but that he suffered that silently, or not so silently as we were talking about it, was really disturbing and makes me believe that these numbers are, are true, which is staggering. Have you ever had a relative killed with a gun? Again, 54.6%. Yes. Have you ever had a friend killed with a gun? 9.2%. And now let's think back to his national studies indicating what is your elevation in risk of you then becoming both a victim as well as a perpetrator of firearm violence. Um, and the recency of these incidents occurring to people at the time of survey is also a stagger. This was a notable uh, 
consultative report published in 2015. Um, and what they noted was Wilmington ranks third in violence among 450 cities. Among all cities with a population greater than 50,000, we are sixth. Not only that, we've had an increase in firearm violence compared to most other cities which have experienced a decrease. This report um, pointed out that we have a number of advantages to the city. We have a large enough police force. In fact, we have more police. We have as much police per census tract area, per population of the city, as pretty much a lot of the larger cities. And so the issue wasn't the number of police available. It was other things. And, and I point this out because these were the recommendations for change coming out of the report. Change staffing and patrol strategies. Do community policing, where rather than being in the patrol car, driving through or responding on an as-needed basis incidents, being proactive, walking around the community, getting to know neighbors, being able to interact with them that way. Utilize hotspot technology. Um, they developed a shot spotter system, little microphones spread throughout the city so that when a shot goes off, you don't have to worry about somebody needing to call that in, um, but that automatically triangulates the location and then summons the police officers to, to arrive at so this really increased response times, uh, improved response times, and reduced response rates. Um, they did not have a dedicated homicide and violent crimes unit, so they formed one um, to standardize the way in which we investigate um, uh, firearm investigations and to really invest in community-based violence prevention. I'm going to tuck this slide in the back of you. Um, they actually did a density analysis, and you see here as a comparison all violent street incidents and all medical incidents. Right? And you see here, the hot spots for this are not dissimilar. Right? They are concentrated in overlapping territories. So I want you to think if the police department has done this commission report and is rethinking strategies for how they can engage a community to prevent these things from happening, if we have a similarly overlapping footprint here right, for medical incidents, well, should not the medical community also think about how we can implement new strategies to address these. Um, again, this is the density of violent street incidents and the hours of the day that these occur. And these are the hourly call logs for medical related things. Um, I'm just gonna fly through some data sources here. So if you're interested in learning more information where you can start pulling up this real time information yourself. So the news journal has been pretty meticulous in reporting on this data for a number of years. They have this going all the way back to 2011. And these are the numbers to look at, ready? Average suspect age, 22.9. Non-homicide arrest rate, 16.3%. Total arrest rate, 20.8%, right? If somebody was killed, this homicide rate rest, uh, arrest rate has actually improved over time. So the 40% now used to be down by 25%. Um, if somebody is killed though, more likely than not, they will never make it. This isn't even conviction, this is just arrest. We look here at the historical data. Um, it's more useful to look at year to date. Last year was a record setting year, hands down, no question about it. This year has actually been much better in comparison and we're still trying to figure out exactly why. Um, I think the police department does need to be recognized for making a number of changes. Um, and I, I think the news journal and even the police department themselves are hesitate to, to call an early victory, um, but I think this is a really remarkable reduction and it really deserves to be. Um, the news journal also keeps track of each shooting and they give a little bit of detail about what happened, where it occurred, when it occurred, what was injuring, what hospital were they taken to. Um, and you can actually go back in time and see the mapping throughout the city um, where these incidents occurred and what the density was. So this, I did this early this morning um, and this is the past seven days. <coughs> this is the past year. Um, and so for context, where I had lived on Pine Street was kind of about over here. Um, actually, while I was there for two and a half years, I ended up holding pressure on gunshot wounds sustained right outside my house, not once, but twice, right? You think about that, just two and a half years of me just living there, being essentially called upon for that situation. Wilmington Police Department has been much more transparent with their data over the past year, and I really applaud them for that. I've been publishing CompStat reports, so comparing what is going on currently in terms of these uh, crimes to historical trends, and we have been doing better across the board, so not just violent injury, um, but nonviolent as well. Um, they also are automatically feeding their data into this engine, crimemapping.com, so you can actually investigate this in more detail and look at it in a geospatial type of way. 
Um, if you are <coughs> particularly um, strange, like myself, you can sign up to get these on your phone as alerts uh, or as emails into your email. So I went and I did a little code to just extract all this data from the news journal. So I went in and scraped all the information from there. And I said, let me, let, me, let me categorize this and see what are the zip codes these are occurring. And to anybody that knows the city, there's no surprise. Three zip codes stand out far and above everybody else. 19801, 802, 805. Um, not only that, if you look at it, um, and this is over the past, since the beginning of the year, each month, um, the incidents have been primarily in 802 um, and 805. And I will say that 802 has some of the least amount and density of social supports within the city. Um, if you look at this over time, you can see the seasonal variation to it, right? And so this is by quarters. Um, and so these uh, spikes correlate with the summer months, but not always. Sometimes there's, uh, last year was particularly, I think, deadly because a lot of shootings happened in February um, and in January. And then when the summertime rolled around, as we know from the national data, those incidents came up. I plotted them up by hour, and you can see that there definitely is a predisposition towards the nighttime. And so if we were to try and come up with intervention program, oh, I'll get to that. Um, so this is the report that has generated a lot of buzz. So the CDC was invited by Wilmington City Council um, to do an epidemiological investigation because they said, we have an epidemic of gun violence that is occurring in Wilmington. How can we model this? How can we understand it? What are the, what, what's going on? What's also notable about this, and this was a national news, is that this was the first meaningful farm research done by the CDC in nearly 20 years related to some politicking that had been going around. Um, we're hoping to change this. Um, publications like the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, I think the last issue or so, put out this kind of plaintive cry saying, please just send us research stuff. We, we want to publish it, we want to push it through. Engage in this research. We're interested, we need this data because of the volume of incidents that are going. So the CDC came in and the, again, the surgery and the trauma department were instrumental in supplying a lot of information. And so what they looked at is from 2011 to 2013, um, there was an increase in 45% in number of farm injuries. Um, this comes to a rate of about one in 500 residents in the city for that plot. So look at this court from 2009 to 2014. They found 569 individuals and they went and they retrieved their data from all different social sectors, from Department of Health and Human Services, from DELGIS, um, the juvenile and adult justice system, the Department of Education, pulling school records from the emergency department here and elsewhere. And said, and even the Department of Labor looking at employment statistics saying, what are the risk factors specific to our context here in Wilmington? And then they did a logistic regression analysis and said, can we build a predictive score based on these risk factors? So uh, this is this is a little notable thing. This is looking at change in homicide rates from 1999 to 2012. Here's Delaware, far and away the biggest outlier. Here's the age demographic again reflects national trends. And this is what they found in terms of percentage. So 13% had been in the ER previously with the gun trap, 5% with the previous stat. Um, blunt weapon injury, so on and so forth. You see these other labor indicators as well. Child welfare investigation, the DFS, um, whether they were on probation or in juvie, quote unquote, whether they've been expelled from school before, and so these percentages make it hard to determine how useful this is, right? Just because there's a high prevalence in the community of, for example, needing um, any kind of child welfare event or being unemployed does not make that specific to being a victim of firearm crime or being a perpetrator of firearm crime. And what this did was looked and said, what's the likelihood of somebody committing a firearm crime within the next six months? And so what they did was they assigned a weighting score um, based on the regression amount. To it. And the numbers that came up as being the greatest risk were pretty much associated with being here in our emergency. So this naturally leads to the question um, as to how do you then use this information? And what they found that it was actually quite specific when you get to a point score of greater than 50. And these were their recommendations moving forward. So link and share data between all of these agents. Everyone operates in these silos. Everyone has their own individual database, but nobody communicates. Right? So I don't know if someone was expelled from school when they come into the ER, even when they come in necessarily to the, to the office for an appointment. Similarly, they don't know if someone's been in the emergency. So refine this pilot risk assessment tool 
they made a specific note preclude use by law enforcement, right? Because we don't want this to turn into something pejorative or punitive. Um, and establish a community advisory board to provide recommendations. So, what are the interventions and what is the path forward based on these kind of novel things? We now have things specifically contextualized to Wilmington, right? You couldn't ask for a better setup for something. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but one of the things across the, the US that's been studied um, is this thing called uh, Hospital Violence Intervention Program. I'll talk about it on the next slide. I bring this up again. Um, again, the, the slide from the, the Police State Strategies Commission, first of the health system. So what are things that we could do um, like the police department has done? Right, so if they are changing their staffing and patrol strategies, is there a way that we can change our staff, right? or our engagement for these people? Is it enough to be able to contact them once they're discharged home? Can we engage them in the emergency department? What does it take to be able to do that? Um, Wilmington Police Department, uh, community policing, what are we doing to improve our primary care access and referrals within these heavily affected communities? Are we using technology that can identify these hot spots or areas prospectively? Do we have a violence intervention program can we standardize our approach to these patients rather than patching them up and having them come out of the hospital? So this is perhaps the best studied um, intervention coming out of the healthcare system. And it's important to say this because not everybody agrees that this falls within the purview of healthcare. Some people would say this involves public safety. This is the police department's job. People are injured, they come to us, we do our best to, to help treat them, but do we really bear that responsibility from a public health perspective, from a primary prevention perspective? And my argument would be, I hope the evidence has shown a resounding yes, that not only can we do that, that we then therefore have an obligation to implement some of these. Um, so HVIPs evolve uh, around these key principles. Identify someone who is violently injured in the healthcare setting engage them at the bedside, seize upon what they call the golden hour, the golden window, right? They're injured, they're in bed, they got nowhere to go, um, and they are potentially reflecting on the circumstances that brought them to that situation, have an opportunity for change. Um, and then connect that to intensive outpatient case management according to patient identified goals. They want a job, expedite their access to a job. They need a place to stay that's safe because people are coming to look, um, look for them to finish their job, can we find them a place that's safe? Can we provide these things? And a lot of this is kind of borrowed from the substance use disorder literature and world where they do these interventions in the hospital saying, look, there's this golden window of opportunity and then we can plug them into all the supportive services because we recognize in substance use disorder, that's important, right? We recognize in substance use disorder, treating their history of trauma and treating their risk factors in a social determinant of health framework reduces their likely to reuse or to relapse, right? So why can't we do something similar when it comes to violence, right? Is that too much? Is that too strange of a thing to ask? So these HBIPs went ahead and did that. They find that the efficacy is boosted when you have an, a credible messenger. So somebody who's from that community, someone who's familiar with the environment who perhaps has been in that walk of life before to do that bedside engagement, just like, oh, say, I don't know, Project Engage does here in our hospital. Um, and then engage in motivational interviewing at that point in time. Best known of these, the San Francisco Wraparound Project is one of the older ones. Um, Temple University also has one. And what they found is that the re-injury rate decreases for those that successfully complete the program. Some of these studies show that even those that only partially complete the program also have a reduction in their re-injury and their recidivism. Um, <clears throat> these are the needs that they were able to meet for people in the program, and it's astounding how high of a percentage they were able to accomplish these things for these patients, right? Seeing them as patients and seeing this as the continuation of the spectrum of care that they deserve as our patients. Temple University found decrease in other sort of behavioral surrogate factors. Indianapolis did this nice study here, um, again, which found that even with only partial program completion, they had a reduction in recidivism. Um, and that people who showed up to the emergency department again afterwards were mainly for these other issues um, that you can make the argument we could also address within the hospital. One of my favorite studies here from Flint, um, this is a quasi-experiment that actually looked at different geographic areas, and they had 
a cluster of social and HVIP programming in one neighborhood as compared to another neighborhood. And they trended that over years of time. And they found that the intervention area definitely had statistically significant less violence um, and less violent injury compared to control and disability. Um, the cure violence approach um, comes out of Chicago, takes it to a different level. And they say, let's interrupt this on the street. Let's do street mediation. If somebody is injured, let's go on there and diffuse the situation. Um, this has gotten a lot of press um, for really hiring people who are ex-offenders or formerly involved with gangs to go in and to literally interrupt that cycle of violence as it's going on, preventing that retaliation literally later that day or that year. What's notable, it's really based though, even though that's the part that gets the most press, it's based on a few key principles, one of which is that you need to change the norms through which that violence is, is perpetrated. Um, this study looked at light remediation. If you go in and you patch up windows and you patch up doors, you remediate vacant lots, um, that has shown violence reduction. This was done just over in Philadelphia. Um, and then they actually did a return investment calculation, found that every dollar you invest in blight remediation, in terms of saving for the taxpayer in reduction of firearm injury and costs associated with that, $5 for every $1 invested um, for abandoned win, uh, building windows and for vacant lots. Um, the Community Advisory Council, which was formed after the CDC report, then also had these additional recommendations, different things that they had done. Um, we have some representatives here from the WCAC. And so I'm very proud and happy to say that um, this had been taking place throughout 2017. Um, and we're looking forward to expanding those programs moving forward. Um, and some of the things that Christiana has been doing, um, Wilmington Up, um, which is teaching street side bleeding control and doing training there. Um, it's an ongoing process now if you're interested in, in being involved. I think Dr. Mendia might be interested in, in uh, pulling you in. And it's been, I think, very popular in the community because it empowers them to feel there's something that I can do if something were to happen. Um, there's the YOLO program the, done by Chaz where we do a trauma resuscitation um, and show them kind of like a mock code in the, the sim lab downstairs to groups of students coming through and the responses to that. Um, and then bedside engagement. Um, so I'm going to end there. I ran over, um, but questions, and I would also like to, if there are not questions, give an opportunity to some of the people involved in the city doing work now um, with the Participatory Action Research Group or others um, to, to weigh in on how they feel the dynamics have been going and what they feel the path forward might look like. Um, but start with questions. Yeah, so we received a small grant, um, not so small to me since it's my first, um, but in collaboration between medicine and the Department of Surgery. And what we want to do is um, we're going to use part of that for a, a research assistant to help us begin to develop this pathway of bedside engagement in a robust fashion, in a way that begins to assess what are the needs that they're identifying. There are a lot of assess needs assessment tools that already exist. We hope to repurpose some of those, but to validate that for our population, our community here to say, are people saying they really need jobs? Talk to Chaz, he'll say that's what they say that they, that they need when he talks to them. How much do they need substance use disorder treatment and therapy? Um, and from there, begin to build this pathway for doing something like a full-fledged hospital violence intervention program, um, where we can actually have that intensive outpatient community-based case management that can follow up with them and really connect them to those services moving forward to decrease the morbidity from all these other things that are going on that predispose them. So just yes. one thing. First of all, I'd like to congratulate all, everyone who's been working on this. I, I think that we can uh, take some heart into the, the lower numbers that we're seeing this year. I think we've all kind of felt that, uh, that it is certainly less than less. Uh, that we're seeing less and less uh, summer. Uh, we should keep our eye on the US Congress as well um, for funding uh, Dutch Ruppersberger, who's the uh, congressman in the, in the Chakramas district in Maryland, is uh, proposed uh, a bill to uh, study uh, hospital-based violence prevention programs. Because you know, of course they have one in shock too. That, um, 
uh, that, that he, he knows about. And, and I think that we would be set up perfectly to apply for those funds if that does get appropriate. Um, and so uh, when we were down at the, uh, a group of us were down representing Delaware at the, the uh, lobby day uh, uh, in, in Washington, he, he uh, uh, spoke about that. And so I think that uh, there's no question that uh, the number one priority uh, in the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma uh, legislative uh, docket is is firearm prevention. There, there's you know virtually all our efforts have have, uh, have gone there. So congratulations to you, and I think that that. Uh, the wonderful work that's being done here in Wilmington will can serve as a model for uh, the rest of the country, and it looks like you know there probably need to be some funding, some national funding, uh, potentially uh, in the very near future. And there, there's ongoing work here. I, I kind of left it a little slight at the end. This is the teaser, but there's a lot that's been going on. Didn't really. We're not at the stage to be able to go public with a lot of things yet, but I want to reassure you that um, people have been very dedicated to this, um, and people have been doing this for a long time. Again, many thanks to the surgery department for pioneering this. Other questions? Yeah. I, I, I'm really interested by the, the program, the, the youth program, is a really large number of hours that we're uh, focusing on. I guess some of the responsibility. How long has it been going on, and when was and what type of outcome? Yeah, so a lot of that was from last year and last summer when shootings were really at their all time high um, and trying to implement these things moving prospectively. And this was based on speaking with a number of community organizations that were already doing services for youth and finding that a lot of them had, had their funding cut over the years, that a lot of them had their hours reduced, that there were city ordinances, more things that had taken place that said, well, teenagers can't really be co-located in the same facility with, with minors. And then suddenly, a program that only had limited space that was co-locating those two things couldn't do that anymore. So what did they do? They dropped their teenager. And so what the city and um, the WCAC felt was that by boosting and by increasing hours where you could get literally these teenagers off of the streets is kind of the term that they use, but really in increased contact with people that could be supports, mentors, such like that, um, that there would be a benefit. So that was kind of throughout last year. Um, looking at metrics and looking at outcomes is always that really difficult thing because if you just go by the number of people shot, like we said, past six months that number's gone down, what caused that? I'm just looking at other surrogate measures and metrics is perhaps more helpful moving prospectively. Um, I can't speak more to the exact findings from the expanded summer hours, but they were quite a bit. Um, and that was also in response to a lot of youth coming to the council saying, we need employment. We want something to do during the summer. Um, and if we're not doing something over the summer, um, that's when we are increasing our social contacts and increasing those opportunities for conflict. Yes. Hey, uh, Dr. Chen, uh, I really do appreciate your modesty. Um, it goes a long way. But there are people who are in the back room taking credit for the decrease. And I think that when we stand as that isolated eye, then we never get anything done. So the one thing that Dr. Gwen Angelette and the Wilmington Community Bobby Council have been able to do is that they've been able to get us together and begin to think as the collective we. So how can that collective we? Because I do believe that there have been some changes in some of the stuff, releasing strategy, that has contributed to the decrease. But I also think that the CIT, the Community Advisory Team, where I'm a program manager, and Coley Harris, the assistant program manager, have also helped in this right here. So similar to the Kiribanis model, we actually try to promote positive youth development. We are, uh, one of our main focus is community engagement. I mean, real community engagement, not where you just come there, uh, what I call fly your gang colors, you know, the CCHS, and then you leave at the end of the day, not really following up with the people in the community. But I'm talking about really being there active, really being there in these people live in a real way. So we just started the CIT uh, community eviction team maybe about two weeks ago, really being on the ground. 
So we have already just in this week alone collected over a hundred referrals. So we're so we're actually out there. Remember, I'm, I'm birthed out of the PAR model, the participatory action research, Dr. Yasser Kane model, which basically argued that structural inequality leads to physical violence. So if those needs ain't met, if poverty is not addressed, if poor school is not addressed, and adequate health care system is not addressed, then you're going to have violence in them disadvantaged neighborhoods. So what we try to do is that we try to go out and actually address those needs early. <laughs> and through that collective work that we're doing at the advisory council, we actually have the people in the room. So about a year ago, about two years ago, when um, I argued the city council that we don't have the political will to really address the violence in a real way. An example I used was that, remember when 495 was closed down? <laughs> remember how they got President Barack Obama up here, the Treasury Secretary up here to sign that check? <laughs> that was political will. But now we got the right people in place so that political will is moving along now. So we got this CIT team really funded in a real way. So now we have young people like Taina, Taina raise hand, right? Who work on our social media because they always come up, we don't have no youth in room. So now we got youth in room. We got the power campaign. So we got uh, Alicia with two young ladies right here. Raise your hand, right? Two more youth. So we got the youth involved now, but we also got some veterans because we need that social capital. Because one of the things that we relied on is that during those times of mediation, right, when you really need the after shooting, you're always trying to buy time. Because buying that time, right, allows that person to do that cost benefit analysis. Because in the moment, you will do something very strange. As a person who lost a son in uh, 2011, September 14th, I remember sitting over there in the emergency room. And I remember the doctors hollering, cold blue, cold blue, room four. And all the doctors running over there. And I'm sitting there helping. Two minutes later, he said, cold blue is over. Then I turned and I said, your son's dead. And I remember my friends coming to me and they're saying to me, they say, hey, girl, hey, girl, let's go get them. What did they say cold that night? Let's go get them. Let's go get the family. Let's retaliate. Let's go get that family because we got to get that family because that's what we're supposed to do. But there was a long voice. I said, if you was on the bus, turn left, you had 250 passengers. If you turn left, you will kill all 250. If you turn left, Whoopi, they call you Whoopi. I said, I said, no, that don't make sense. But if you turn right, only one person died, 250 lived. And then their kids lived. What would you do? I said, well, the one person. He said, well, no, your son is dead. Go out there and save you 250. But right now, what we need is we don't need no bloody revolution. We need a spiritual revolution, cultural revolution, an economic revolution, right? We need to start changing those paradigms. Like you said, we need to change those community norms. And I think that that's what the Community Advisory Council, uh, Christian and Care, and all of our other partners have come to the realization that we can no longer stand as that isolated eye. We got to stand together as that collective way. And I think that the CIT team, some of the things that we're implementing, we're a referral system. Or early identification system, we just left this morning. People are really digging their heels in. So I really do appreciate you, uh, Dave, for being humble. Uh, Sandra, always being humble, because um, there's a lot of things. I see you guys in the community. We'll be in the community tomorrow where Riverside Day, in a real way. You know what I'm saying? But I really do appreciate uh, some of the things you've done. And I like the way you guys are down here trying to change, because not only do we got to change social norms in Wilmington. We also got Jim down here at the hospital and I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you. He gave you the inside scoop that I, I can't. <laughs> We're absolutely looking forward to doing more of that ground level. You guys hear soon about it. Any other questions? A little bit over. Thank you all for coming.